Okay, so the first uh, speak, let's welcome Derek uh, Bor Boris, hopefully I'm pronouncing it right, who is a leading uh, product manager at AMD. He manages the development of the Rockham platform, the reading open computer platform at, for AMD GPUs. So Derek has also been involved in design development and the deployment of security and the compute actuators for over 20 years. So let's welcome Derek. There, you should be able to see my screen and hear me. Great. Yep, thanks, pretty good. Well, thanks for the invite, Yifan. It's uh, It's been a pleasure working with you over the past uh, few years as uh, part of uh, bringing up HIP with different workloads and creating uh, tutorial materials. It's It's been an interesting time. Um, and today I wanted to talk a little bit about where things are going, where we see things going with uh, GPUs and the, the programmability, how to make it portable um, and, and also performant. So I've been at AMD for almost five years doing the product management of the Rockham stack. And that covers everything from device drivers up through libraries, tools, uh, compilers, and, uh, and libraries and frameworks. So uh, feel free to ask questions. I'll leave some time at the end so we can go over um, different parts, but I uh, also want to have um, just a quick cautionary statement. Let's see. So that in case I do say anything that's forward looking, uh, we are in the quiet period right now at the end of the quarter. Um, I don't expect to say anything uh, tangential to that. But most of this is, you know, from my experience at AMD, all these content is public. Um, so feel free to ask questions and I can answer uh, what, what's possible at this time. So splitting the talk into three sections. First, I'm gonna talk about some of the architecture and server designs, then how that falls into GPU parallel programming methodologies, and then dive into a little bit more detail around HIP compiling, debugging, and profiling with that methodology. So if we start at the high level, you know, really everything's revolving around data. There's more and more data. We can't keep up to it. Uh, we're processing it faster getting more information, um, it, it, the machines are becoming more powerful and we have to be able to make decisions based on the data. So the faster we can process this, the, be the better it is for everyone. And so traditionally, GPUs were figured out that they were great for doing compute workloads. And over the last 10 or 15 years now, GPUs have been um, used for HPC workloads, discovered that they were great for some of the AI type workloads. And what we're seeing is in the hardware is more and more dedicated um, silicon for those compute cycles. So things like a, a matrix operation, um, different precisions. So the standard GPU isn't just a GPU anymore. It's highly optimized compute. Um, it's also looking at how the interaction with those units with the different levels of cache, um, L1 cache, a local data share, as well as scheduling uh, that memory transfer from internal to external memory. And so we'll go through a, a, just a few highlights of what we have in our latest series, the MI200. Um, if we look at the core concept, the, the CDNA chiplet, uh, there's many of those um, operations inside each chiplet in terms of CUs, we call those compute units. And then we take those chiplets, package them into a larger package into an OEM. That's part of the open compute platform module definition. This is a fairly advanced um, uh, packaging methodology uh, with the fan out bridge. But what's also interesting is that uh, over time, the GPUs have added HBM memory that's really fast bandwidth directly tied to those compute units. That allows those compute um, memory bandwidth bound compute operations to get higher performance and saturate the compute engines. Also with this packaging, we have a high speed interconnect between those triplets and also an interconnect that can go to a GPU or PCIe type 
or sorry, CPU or PCIe type uh, interfaces. So if we look at the server topology that drives out of those type of uh, designs from the, the GPU, this is for PCIe type architectures. Um, so if we look on the left-hand side, this would be a system that would have uh, four GPUs, each connected in, in pairs and, and tied to two CPUs. Um, depends on the server architecture, the PCI switches are optional, the AMD EPIC processors have a lot of uh, built-in PCIe interfaces. And so it is possible to build systems without the switches. And then we, on the right-hand side, is a bit larger scale out where you have uh, two pods of four GPUs each with interconnects between them. So there's bridge boards that sit over top of the PCIe interface and you get that um, high speed connection between the GPUs so you can transfer data um, without having to go through the PCIe infrastructure. So again, another type of architecture uh, advancement over time that uh, changes the way we program GPUs and the way they scale out to the different workloads. This is a diagram from Crusher, which is just announced at uh, Oak Ridge as their first um, stand up of the small component of Frontier. So this architecture diagram is, uh, I'll walk through it a little bit, starting on the right hand side. So if we think of those GPUs connected on, you see the red boxes, the high speed interlinks between the GCDs, those compute dies in one module, and this shows four modules on the platform. Each of those modules uh, can talk to each other module. So the gray lines connecting them. Um, and then there's different bandwidth between the different uh, ratios, but you can create ring topologies um, or direct connections between each one. Each of those modules also has a PCIe interface for a NIC, so you can connect to the network. And then we have the, um, the links to the CPU that creates what I mentioned earlier, that cache coherent interface to the CPU. And then you have the NUMA domains. If you look on the left-hand side, this is a breakdown of all the different NUMA domains and how each group of threads connects to a specific GPU. And so you can get down to that level of detail of the platform architecture when you're writing your code to dedicate, you know, a couple of specific threads tied to a certain memory region and then down into a specific uh, GPU module. That's the level of detail that's needed to get the best performance out of that hardware. Um, so how that's abstracted is what I'll get into in, in the rest of the talk. And this slide is public. Um, there is a nice actually user guide uh, that Oak Ridge posted on the website. So I invite you to go look at that too. And so as a scientist, if you have an application and you say you're working for the DOE and you have uh, access to machines, if you look at the history of machines that are available, there's a wide range of architectures um, with all with different variations of accelerators or at least the most recent ones. And that's still continuing with uh, the Frontier coming up and then El Capitan announced for next year. And so you want your application to run across all those systems without much effort in changing it. And so ideally you want that to be performant, you want the code to be portable, and you don't wanna spend a lot of time changing the code to get new research done. So in the performance side, you want to make sure that you have uh, the best uh, performance for the like bang per, per watt as well as scaling from single to multi or, or thousands of nodes. So as you're developing your application, uh, as a scientist, you don't wanna spend a lot of time um, figuring out, oh, well, this has a different NIC interface. I have to spend you know, six months figuring out how to scale this application on this machine. You, you want that all abstracted. And so why can't programmers just write the optimal code? And it's really because, you know, as we looked at the details, each system is quite different. And as you um, 
you abstract those details, you get more productivity. But with that abstraction, sometimes you pr prevent uh, writing optimal code directly. And I'll try to illustrate that as we go through a few more slides here. So generally, as you tune the hardware, your performance increases, but then your portability drops. So if you're hard coding specific values based on a cache size that you know happens to be in a certain GPU, that's not very transferable to even the next generation of GPU inside of an architecture. And I, th I think this slide, I have threw it in, I, I do quite a few talks for uh, folks that haven't done GPU programming, but uh, I'm assuming most folks here have that background, but really what, what is happening is you're moving parallel code onto something that's an accelerator that's designed to do parallel work. And the question is, how do you synchronize that between the CPU and GPU? And as we go through, you can see that, you know, you're usually moving lots of data. Um, the, the data sets are huge. The memory regions are huge. Uh, so there's lots of considerations as you're doing the parallel work. Can you keep that GPU um, filled as well as um, keep the CPU busy or not waiting and, and letting it do other work that, while the, the accelerator is off uh, busy handling the work that it's best designed for and most efficient for. And so one of the key things of is the memory management side of why it's difficult to program in this environment. It's because quite often you're shuffling or managing the memory between these two different devices. Um, so you have your host CPU, it's got some dedicated memory. You've got your device and it has its own dedicated memory. And there's more and more interactions that have been built over the last few years to help um, abstract that memory transfer process. Um, but th this is one of the reasons why, why traditionally GPU programming has been difficult to uh, manage. So if we look at this slide, we have sort of three different categories of um, transitioning memory. And if we start at the top, the Threadripper with the Radeon 7, is you know, a standard desktop computer, PCIe based, you have that GPU to GPU or CPU to GPU connection, and you have to explicitly copy the data back and forth. Um, with the Epic CPU and MI100, and uh, with the large bar support, you actually get um, some advantage where you can allocate a page locked memory in the host, and this system looks after managing the memory. And then with the Frontier-based architecture where the Epic CPU actually has cache coherent with the MI250X, you can actually just malloc and then point a, a host um, or pass a host pointer to, to the kernel and it will manage the memory process. So in terms of the programming instruction, it ends up a little easier because it looks more like a CPU but it also improves the performance. So as I was saying that it's nicer to abstract this hardware um, through all the different layers so that you do get that um, easier to program behavior. And then we'll talk a little bit more about what that is specifically. So through this stack, uh, I ordered it in this order. And maybe at the end, we can have a discussion of, is this the right order? Maybe some of them should be swapped in terms of what is the, the better way to do increased abstraction or, or what is easier to program. Um, but I started at the hardware specific side, then specific accelerator languages, directive-based extensions, um, the standard languages, uh, libraries like the math and communication libraries, as well as, uh, higher level abstractions with frameworks. So in HPC, there's Cocos, Raja, um, in, in Legion, with the machine learning frameworks, there's TensorFlow and PyTorch. And then uh, even on top of that, now we're seeing domain specific languages where the scientists will write code in Python and it'll auto-generate OpenMP code and uh, spit out a, a code that can be compiled then for your target architecture. So. This is a pretty interesting list. Uh, it's probably not complete, 
there's many different things being, I would say, uh, developed as it's a really fast moving industry in the last uh, five years. Um, I think we'll see more accelerator languages, um, possibly more extensions to things like OpenMP, as well as uh, we're seeing things that move in the standard languages like C++ parallel components, as well as Fortran. Um, there's a lot of interesting work in Python where they're looking at adding, you know, abstraction libraries for accelerators. Um, AMD is helping uh, sponsor some of that work. So let's have a discussion at the end. I'm curious to see what your thoughts are and if this is the right order, but uh, we'll continue on with a few other thoughts on what AMD is doing with HIP. Um, it's the accelerator language, very similar to CUDA. And we've had some great success with it in terms of porting applications over to HIP and then being able to run that on many other devices. So HIP is a runtime API. It's a, as well as the kernel language that you can develop with. It looks very similar to um, traditional CUDA programming for accelerators and it's fully open source. So we published everything up on GitHub. And one of the new things I wanted to call out here is the work we've been doing with uh, Argon National Labs on the Intel GPUs. And there's a project under chip SPV. It was called HIPLZ before. Um, and it's an, a, another way to run HIP code on Intel GPUs. So as part of the migrating different um, specific kernel code over, we have the libraries and a full set of math libraries like BLAS, FFT, um, linear algebra libraries, as well as machine learning libraries like MIOpen, and then communication libraries like Ripple. There's a, a complete um, suite where we've been migrating uh, applications to use these libraries as that abstraction with HIP. So as part of the HIP process, you can convert your application and then call it calls the specific library for your target hardware. And we've automated that process through a set of conversion tools called Hippify Perl and Hippify Clang. Um, they are uh, sort of like what the titles say, uh, it's search and replace string um, on with a Perl script. And then Clang is more of a front end to, to the compiler where it'll give you a bit better error handling messages. This goes through converts the code, keeps your original code, creates your new code. And then what's the interesting part is how you maintain that going forward. So some applications will maintain two streams. They'll take their original CUDA code, um, sequester that and say, okay, change all the make files and gonna build a, a different tree for HIP and continue that for the AMD implementation. Other ones convert everything to HIP and then just maintain that HIP interface going forward and use the compiler tool chains for the target hardware because uh, the HIP interface allows you to do that. One other tool we've created for conversion um, more recently is called GPU Fort. Uh, this is great for taking open ACC Fortran code and converting that to HIP. So that allows you to take your um, module or your, your kernels that were in the open ACC convert them to a module and then import them with the standard like ISOC binding methodology into your Fortran application. So as you're going through your application, um, this is a sort of a decision tree starting from general application code. First, you have to decide if your code base is parallelizable or not and if it's already been accelerated. And the next slide will go into code that's already been accelerated. But if you have a standard application, you know there's parallel code in there, what do you do first, right? Can you run OpenMP? Um, yes, if you can do that, you can add your target offload components. Uh, is your performance okay? Great, then you just go ahead and do some science. 
or you can use instead of OpenMP, you could, like we mentioned earlier, that some of the frameworks, either Cocos or Alpaca, Raja, et cetera. So there's a few different methodologies of you know, taking your non-accelerated code and trying to see if that works. Ideally, you profile your code first to know what the bottlenecks are to make sure that the effort of going through this is worthwhile. And then if your performance isn't great in that space, maybe you do change it to uh, HIP and look specifically for kernels that would run um, better in that environment. And so this is the extension of the previous slide where your decision tree of existing parallel code exists. Um, and this is credit to George at CSC. Uh, he, he's done a great work with the group at Lumi in taking their code bases, training it, engineers and scientists to convert their code over. And he has a lot of great talks uh, on the web, so I invite you to look him up. And walking through this, um, it, it's pretty interesting to see the different paths, but it also shows just how complex the different paths and decisions are. So, you know, is it C++, is it Fortran, um, is it OpenACC code? Uh, you know, what's your performance like? How much time do you spend tuning it? And then where do you tune it? Do you turn, tune it in the application? Do you tune it um, in the specific kernel? And to dive a little deeper into the code, uh, this is an example of uh, taking OpenMP um, to HIP and compiling it as, an, uh, as wait, there's the, pictures. Um, so taking a module as a Rockman interface, which has a subroutine that can then be converted to um, a, a separate C component that's compiled with HIPCC and then imported as a module. So it just shows a, a quick example of how to use HIP inside of a, um, a Fortran type application. On the C or C++ side, uh, this is an example of taking Hippify Perl to convert to the Plassian. Um, so this is the actual low level kernel where you're doing the actual operation in the accelerator. And really, if you look from the left side to the right side, the code is the same with just the inclusion of the header file. Then when you call the code, again, very similar uh, setup in your application where you set Define your this memory sizes and launch your kernel. Um, as of uh, a few years ago now, the Rockham 3.5, we implemented the triple chevron so you can keep the same format as well if you desire. So, along with converting code, you need the compiler, debugger, and profiler to understand. Uh, what's, ha what's happening in your code base. Um, all our tool chain is open source and er based on LLVM, we, we upstream as much of that as possible. With the Rock GDB, uh, we have uh, great support for the CPU and GPU all within one um, tool chain. And uh, again, upstreaming uh, the components there as much as possible. And it's going quite well. And you there you can also integrate it into different graphical interfaces. And as we go through a little bit more later in the talk, I'll step through some of the, the debugging uh, more on the command line side of things. Then the profiler, we have RockProf. It's a library with an API and a command line interface that provides a JSON output, which has been integrated into third-party tools, including the AMD MicroProf, uh, the version 3.5 that came out in January, February, uh, now supports that as well, internal in the application. Um, with the JSON output, you can import that into things like Chrome tracing or uh, other tools. Um, it, the profiling is really where you start to understand where your GPU is spending time or where your CPU is spending time waiting for your GPU or accelerator. So on the compiler side, Generally, you have your host code, you have uh, your HIP APIs, and then your HIP kernel code. 
you'd throw that all into a HIPCC and then you'd define you know, with your, which target platform you're targeting. Um, so if you are using uh, the AMD one, it's the HIP platform and use this client compiler version. Um, if you're targeting NVIDIA, you use the NVCC tool chain. So you get their optimizations and implementations for their hardware. And what happens there is you end up with um, the same performance as you would have expected uh, with the original hardware on NVIDIA because it's still using their tool chain. It's really just the, the shim layer that's in between. I won't go through all the little details of the build system. Um, these are a few slides that I've taken from uh, some of the tutorials we do. We, we have quite a bit of content online, but um, I'll, I'll just call out a few important uh, components as we go through. So here you can see there, there's a section that's the host only code, the, the hip kernel code, and then the linking stage. And then as you pass your flags through, you can see that you get the specific libraries that you need to include based on what flags you pick, either for MPI or for your, your base compiler. And so, you know, it's fairly straightforward make file, but what's missing uh, with the AMT, you have to add the GPU target and you need to add each target for each architecture that you want to compile that application for. So the graphics at 900, 906, 908, et cetera. And that's pretty well defined in the in, um, user guides of which graphics uh, component to use for which target hardware you're using. So if we dive into the debugger a little bit, um, it's got ISO level debugging as well as uh, no, you can step through the host code through um, HIP as well as uh, OpenMP calls. Uh, so to compile, when, you, when you're compiling your code, you need to add a specific flag to add the debugger um, output. And then as you dive into it, um, you have your standard GDB interfaces. Let's skip over that. But what you can do is just like normal things, you can set breakpoints and inside your kernel. So here is part of that Jacobian. Um, you can see inside we're actually in the kernel code setting the breakpoint and we get the break stopping there. Um, so you set the breakpoint and then it'll pop out which uh, context is in, in which thread it's at. Step through. Um, how many of the kernels have been launched, the index of the wave front in the kernel. So it just helps you debug where you are because in these multi-threaded systems, um, it's really hard to understand exactly what's executing when it hits the breakpoint. So these give you hints on how to uh, decode where you are and what's still running in your step. So then at the, at the end of that, you may want to uh, disable that. So you click that. And, and then you step through and the other wave fronts can then just continue in the, because they're all parallel inside of the accelerator, they're running on their own. And when you get to the very end, you'll see that you have, um, you can spit out the info of all the threads running and the other threads have actually all completed because you've stopped on one, but the rest ran to completion while you were investigating what was happening in that one thread. So that's just a quick intro into some of the issues you can run into or the concepts for uh, debugging. Next, I'll talk a little bit about uh, profiling. Um, so as I mentioned, Rock Prof is uh, this front end uh, for the profiler and we've just um, worked through some of the um, expansion of what counters are available. So generally there's a, a profiler help uh, interface. So I'll walk through uh, which flags, what, what these mean. 
because they, they do have consequences on how you're profiling your code. Um, so in terms of the counters, uh, there's usually not enough, um, you call it memory space. There's not enough um, to run at every time uh, and collect all the counters. So sometimes you have to run your application multiple times with a different set of counters to collect all the equivalent data. Um, so that's probably one of the most difficult parts of um, first setting up and understanding your profiler. And as we've added more counters, we're trying to make that easier by having a higher level um, stack of what what's counters are interesting. Um, here's a list of some of the commonly used counters, but over this next year, we're looking at how to make this just a, a more usable, uh, friendly interface from the top level of the application. And there's a lot of good tools in the industry that are, we're working with that will um, help, help abstract this. So usually things that are interesting are like the cache hits, um, how are, are the GPU compute units actually busy? So the percentage of time busy, um, it, all within a certain window. And so that way you can tell if your that kernel is either memory bound or compute bound. That's usually the first th thing to figure out because you know if you're um, memory bound and you can increase your um, memory uh, throughput, then there's no sense spending more time trying to optimize the kernel. A couple of other tricks, um, just learning about the, the kernel duration. So you can put in uh, timestamps. So you have uh, just a good sense of like wall clock time or, or real time of execution. That's pretty important to understand. Um, the part I wanted to highlight is more about what level when you're doing the tracing or profiling. Um, so there's a few different uh, flags you can put in. So you can program or uh, trace at the hip layer. So that's as the, um, the CPU is calling into the, the runtime. Then you have uh, the GPU kernels. That's more the HSA trace layer, um, as well as the hosted device memory uh, transfers. And then the low level HSA tracing from the CPU and then specific code markers. So throughout your code, you can put um, little markers so that you know um, where a certain region is uh, running and then it'll put a, a timestamp there for you in the output. And as you can imagine, as you have these different flags, they have different performance impacts on the actual runtime of your application. So just like um, as soon as you're trying to measure something, it changes the behavior of that system. Uh, so here you can see that obviously the HSA trace is uh, almost twice as slow as the base implementation. But some of the other tracing components are um, more reasonable in terms of a you know 15 to 20% hit in terms of understanding what's going on. The counter collection is also a significant factor. So you just have to be aware that you know if your program ran for an hour is going to take uh, longer than when you actually try to profile it. And this is a, a nice little picture of a simple interface for uh, taking that JSON file. So as you spit it out, it's imported into the Chrome uh, utility. Um, there's a few other new utilities. I think Profeto is another one that, that does well with these JSON files. Uh, but you can see the, the connection between the different uh, CPU components and then the copies over to the GPU, as well as this next one, um, the actual uh, trace modes going through um, into the actual, the Jacobian kernel. Again, we have uh, some great, uh, oh, here's one, one more on, um, just enabling all the different components. You can see the, the HSA queues uh, pop up in the list. Um, 
but the, on our uh, website, we have uh, nice tutorials on some of the rock prof components. And one final thing to talk about in rock prof is scaling out. Um, so you can actually just include rock prof as part of your MPI uh, scale out to produce uh, um, uh, scaling, but this is only for MPI on a node. It doesn't support multi-node at this time. And that's one thing we're working with the industry to um, get better insight into how we scale out uh, multi-GPU nodes across multiple nodes. Okay, so changing gears a little bit, just to summarize, um, I had mentioned some of the framework support in uh, machine learning earlier. In HPC, um, I would say the industry is still figuring out which are becoming the most popular. But in machine learning, uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch have basically taken over for almost all machine learning engineers. And if you talk to most scientists in that space, they don't actually understand or even realize what hardware is running underneath, other than they know how long their job takes. And so that's one of the nice things about the abstraction at that level. Um, and then we do spend a lot of time with the code owners and our libraries optimizing for our hardware through the, the underliers of those frameworks. So that's just an example of how the framework implementations into applications can help speed up across the industry. So it gives that portability um, but then the performance is almost owned by the silicon vendors to make sure that that framework runs very well on their hardware. And just to expand on the HPC applications, um, we've been working with uh, quite a few of the ISVs that have been porting their code over to the AMD uh, HIP implementations. Um, we also have some of the open source applications posted in containers on AMD Infinity Hub. So I invite you to go there. That's a forum for um, where we're pointing all users and that's where our documentation is as well as um, links to the tutorials. And then we also, in this part of that post a, a catalog. So, you know, AMD is doing some of the porting of applications but the industry is also embracing HIP as a portability solution. There's lots of different libraries and components that uh, have created an implementation that's available there. And if for more interaction with the community, uh, there's actually an AMD user forum. Um, this is a HPC uh, focused group out of um, San Diego. And the it's all, AMD helps sponsor it, but it's actually run through universities. There's uh, various working groups that meet weekly. Uh, we had a few events the last few years, but so far they've all been virtual. We hope uh, this year we can maybe get to meet in real life. That'd be great. But uh, connect on the HBC user forum page and uh, um, Susan will reach out to you and join you to the right groups for what you're interested in. And with that, I'll leave you with a, just a page of uh, various links that I talked about through the talk and open it up to questions. I want to thank you for your time today and to, happy to answer questions and have a discussion. Okay, I see there are three questions in the chat window. So the first one is raised by Imad. Uh, Al Azir, uh, he asked, what type of are the links between the GPUs? I think that's in a relatively early uh, slides. It's uh, either slide six or seven. So when you show the MI200 and uh, the connection there. Right, so those are actually, we call it infinity fabric. It's the same type of phi from PCIe, but it's a separate protocol. So you get higher bandwidth than what's available through PCIe. So it's an AMD proprietary link. Think of it that as that. Should 
Uh, I'll just read out the questions. Does that work, Ifan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Okay. So how does passing a host pointer to the GPU improve performance? The CPU GPU bandwidth is 36 gigabytes per second from your figure, while GPU HPM bandwidth is 1.6, right? So in terms of performance, um, what it allows you to do is, um, yeah. yeah, so it depends on your application. Like, like everything, there's always, a, it depends. Um, so if you're passing the actual performance of moving the data doesn't change, but allows you as a application uh, owner to go and do something else instead of managing that memory at the same time. So you can let the uh, device go and reach for the memory through a hardware interface instead of having to marshal it through with a software interface. So, so this is oh, this is my question. Uh, okay. Yeah. Briefly, um, does the data is is it right saying the data does not migrate that it would stay on the in the system memory on the CPU? So you're doing remote access and that. Yeah, case? yeah. There's there's two ways. One is that, and the other is just setting up the DMA engine to copy it uh, directly. But yeah, is it, generally uh, you want to. Um, I've seen it also the other way where you have the GPU allocate or you allocate the memory on the GPU, you move it there, and then the CPU can access the GPU memory directly. That's oh, okay. the other okay. benefit, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, so the code, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Yeah, the next question is by Nico Agustini. Um, the code probability between vendors is a step in the right direction, and uh, he can give you five. It's an interesting way of implementing it. If conversion are successful, is to improve the performance of a custom kernel also portable, or additional work has to be done to maximize the performance for the AMD devices? Right. Yeah. And, uh... I would say that's where it always gets fuzzy. So it depends what happens in that implementation of a custom kernel. Um, if you're using specific um, ISA level instructions, so like PTS instructions or AMD GCN instructions, those are not portable right off the bat. Um, but what also happens is in the kernel, because of the different architectures between different vendors, um, maybe a specific order that you know because of like a certain cache size in one device or a certain number of wave fronts is available. If you put in specific tunings for that, then oh, again, that's not performant portable across the implementations. Okay, so uh, 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 add-on question uh, is moving forward. When porting new applications, keep the implementation preferred over an open sale implementation? Yeah, I, I would say generally I've seen uh, more people move to HIP. Uh, there's still some interest in OpenCL, especially for existing applications. But when starting with a new application, HIP it, it probably has, a, uh, I would say, a much longer um, cycle in terms of performance and optimization effort being applied. And it's also, um, uh, yeah, just more portable. Well, I was. I would say OpenCL, yeah, there, there's differences between which vendor supplies which components, but it's also been stable for quite a long time. So we do still support it, but uh, I would say generally HIP is the preferred approach. Yeah, so uh, I, I think a follow up question from my side. So uh, is OpenCL basically um, just functionally maintained as the Rockham platform, or is actually being considered as uh, like also optimized for performance for AMD GPUs and Rockham platform? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, that's a good question. I would say at this point, we're mostly supporting it for functionality, but not spending as much time as performance. If there's large performance deltas, then yes, it gets looked at, but in terms of overall effort, the efforts on the HIP side. All right, uh, thank you very much. So the next question is, how about Rockham support for embedded AI applications? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when I first started at AMD, I thought, okay, Rockham's gonna support everything under the sun at, at AMD. That's still my goal. Um, we've really focused on the data center GPUs, uh, 
that we've recently brought support uh, official support into the workstation GPUs. Um, so that's the RDNA type uh, uh, cards. So like the gaming cards, consumer cards, um, migrating towards that. But what I have seen over time is people taking uh, the Rockham stack and running it on embedded platforms. Uh, there's a specific example I know of where it's running in a satellite in space running TensorFlow on a, a small APU. Um, and with the, the Vega uh, GPU component as the accelerator. So even though AMD hasn't officially done support on all of those, because our platform's open source, it exists. And, and as we're doing more work with Xilinx, we acquired them, if people don't know, it happened this past uh, month or so. Um, there's lots of interesting work going on uh, to sort of merge some of those technologies and support. All right, uh, so Darshan, uh, yeah, thank you for pinging me back. Um, so uh, that's all the questions in the chat window. So I wonder if there's any other questions uh, in the audience that you, if you want to ask, we can directly speak up. Uh, hi, I guess I have a question about the Xilinx acquisition, and I'm wondering if in the future we are going to see uh, the FP an FPJ fabric integrated inside the GPU, as similar to the way we have like tensor core supports. Uh, do is there any plan to integrate FPJ units there? Yeah, I'm sure there is, but I can't comment on it. I actually I don't know. But um, I, to me, that would make sense. Um, but that's about all I can say at this time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, so I, I actually also want to ask another question uh, from my side. So um, as we see the most recent MI200 series GPUs, we start to see some multi-chip uh, module uh, a packaging uh, implementation. And uh, MCM GPUs definitely has uh, some NUMA effect, um, this type of um, complexities. So is there any special support in the Rockham uh, software stack to address this problem? Hmm. That's a really good question. I would say there's no specific support to automatically fix it, but definitely, we're aware of it in terms of like you know giving guidance as we port applications to say oh yes if you pin these threads to that uh, numo domain then you get better performance and we try to give guidance on that but um so far not automatically okay thank you very much um just want to check if there's any other questions in the audience Okay, if we don't have any questions, uh, okay, there's another question. How is the development framework support for AMD GPUs? Um, so specifically around uh, machine learning or HPC, uh, deep learning. Okay, so uh, start with TensorFlow, it's fully upstream. Uh, we provide Docker containers uh, ready to go with the AMD implementation. Uh, it's on our Infinity Hub. Uh, it's pretty st straightforward to use. Um, PyTorch, again, fully upstream. Uh, we're on the front page for support for the pytorch.org. So you can get the Python, um, uh, or sorry, the implementation there, as well as on our Infinity Hub. And um, we've also done work with uh, Jax. Uh, we have our own uh, fork of that, working on getting that upstreamed. Um, it, Deep speed as a component and Onyx runtime as components, those are also upstream. Um, so what we've seen generally is that any customer or end user that takes a model, something like it's on hugging face and uses the implementation, it, it just works out of the box. Um, and most of the time with decent performance, sometimes uh, 
you know, we do some specific tuning in a lower level library like Rock Boss to make sure that that uh, implementation runs well. So overall, I would say the support is pretty great. Thank you. So it, it, this question actually reminds me another question. So uh, uh, we see uh, Rockham start to roll out for some RDNA GPUs. So is there any special thing for RDNA GPUs? Then like the architecture is totally different. Uh, mm -hmm. from the GCN series and the CDN series GPUs, right? And also the uh, the waveform size, the warp size are different. So any is there, are there any special uh, optimization or is there special guidance for users to um, to use RDNA GPUs? Right. That, yeah, that's a great question, and that sort of touches on the point of like how where does that optimization happen for each hardware architecture? And um, with the RDNA side, we have enabled it from the device driver so that we have a common device driver through graphics and compute. Uh, the libraries have now been tuned for the RDNA uh, implementation of RDNA 2. So that's where the abstraction for the machine learning frameworks happens is things like an MI Open, Rock Blast. Those libraries have that optimized support for that hardware architecture. So AMD has done that work, and then the end user just sees the benefit of it. Okay, thank you very much. So I just want to check again with the audience if you have any other questions. Feel free to speak up or type in the chat window. All right, so uh, if you don't have any questions, then send again for Derek for the one for talk, then you definitely provided a lot of information for the AMD's effort on general purpose uh, GPU uh, implementation. So thank you very well, thank much. Thank you. Yep. So yeah. I think uh, right now we're, uh, as our schedule, we're going to have a break. So that way uh, in the next session, we're going to have a few um, very, very interesting papers and invited talks. So um, we're, we're going to come back at 11.30. So I hope you will continue to stay here and uh, let's uh, um, join the part, uh, paper presentation and the invited talks for the next session. Okay, um, thank you very much. I'm going to share a splash okay. screen then so that uh, it can remind us the time that we're going to start next.